Anatoly Golitsyn, The Perestroika Deception Forward by the author This collection of my memoranda to the Central Intelligence Agency is about Soviet grand strategy and the new dimensions of the threat to the Western democracies. There is a marked difference between the American and the communist use of the term strategy. Americans tend to think of strategy in short range terms in relation to presidential election campaigns, in football or baseball games, or in such instances as the strategy of stonewalling during the Watergate investigations. For Russian communists, on the other hand, strategy is a grand design or general party line which governs the party's actions over a long period and contains one or more special maneuvers designed to help the party Chief its ultimate object, the seizure of power in Russia in 1917, the subsequent expansion of the communist camp and the final worldwide victory of communism. This book shows that the essence of the special maneuver in the present grand strategy for communism lies internally in the creation and use of controlled political opposition to effect a transition to a new so-called democratic or non-communist or nationalist power structures which remain in reality communist controlled. Internationally, the essence of the maneuver lies in the use of the political potential of these new power structures to develop contacts and promote solidarity with the Western democracies as a means towards the achievement of world communist victory through the convergence of the communist and non-communist systems. The main purpose of my defection at the end of 1961 was a to warn the American government about the adoption of the current grand strategy for communism and the political role of the KGB and the use of disinformation and controlled political opposition which the strategy entailed and b to help the west neutralize kgb penetration of the governments on arrival in washington i asked to be received by president kennedy i was assured by general taylor the president's security advisor that the president would see my appropriate contributions mr robert kennedy the attorney general told me that in due time a meeting with the president would be arranged General Taylor wrote to me in the following terms. The White House, Washington, 21st December 1961. Dear Mr. Golitsyn, I have your letter of December 19th, 1961, addressed to the President of the United States. The subject matter is one of considerable interest to, the go to this government and your request has received careful consideration. I wish to assure you that the officials with whom you are now in contact have the full authority and responsibility for handling matters of this nature, and I therefore request that you give them your complete cooperation. I have asked that I be kept informed of developments in this matter, and you may be conf confident that information concerning your contribution will be brought to the attention of the President if and when appropriate. Maxwell D. Taylor. While waiting for the meeting, I limited my cooperation with the CIA, FBI and Allied services to the problems of KGB penetration of the American, British and French governmental institutions. After President Kennedy's assassination, I briefed the head of the CIA and the head of that agency's counterintelligence staff about communist long-range strategy, the creation of the disinformation department and Chalapin's reorganization of the KGB into a political arm of the party. On many subsequent occasions, I had opportunities to brief other leading Western services on the subject of lo Soviet long-range strategy and the new R61E of the KGB, recommending a reassessment of the communist problem. A few counterintelligence officials in the CIA and the British and French services began to understand and accept the validity of my views. For me, the most encouraging development was the understanding I received from Count de Maranches, the 
chief of the French intelligence service under the late President Pompidou. Count de Maranches provided me with opportunities to work with his service on the reassessment of communist developments in terms of Soviet strategy. In the presence of a dozen senior officials of his service, Count de Marachin stated that he was in agreement with my views on the existence of the strategy and of disinformation, but I was unable to explain my ideas in detail because my project with the service was terminated. This growing awareness about disinformation and the political role of the KGB in implementing the strategy was interrupted by the Watergate hearings, which weakened the American services, and by the unfortunate death of President Pompidou, which weakened the position of the French service. Despite adverse circumstances, I have made a con consistent attempt to analyze important developments in the USSR and other communist countries through the prism of communist long-range strategy, strategic disinformation, and the political R61E of the KGB. I continue to submit my memor memoranda to the CIA about significant communist developments and made suggestions on how to improve the agency's understanding of communist strategy. In 1984, I published a book, A New Lies for Old, about communist strategic political disinformation. In the book and in my memoranda, I made several significant predictions about the future developments of the communist world. I predicted that the communist strategists would go beyond Marx and Lenin and would introduce economic and political reforms in the USSR and Eastern Europe. I predicted the legalization of solidarity in Poland, the return to so-called democratization in Czechoslovakia and the removal of the Berlin Wall. I warned about a political offense to promote a neutral socialist Europe which would work to Soviet advantage. I also warned that the West was actually vulnerable to the coming major, si major shift in communist tactics. It is axiomatic that political ideas should be tested out in practice. And it is a fact that many of my predictions, particularly about the coming economic and political reforms in the USSR and Eastern Europe, passed the test and were confirmed by subsequent events, particularly in Poland and Czechoslovakia. It remains also a fact that leading Soviet experts like Mr. Zbigniew Brzezinski failed to make accurate predictions about these developments. This failure on the part of Mr. Brzezinski and other experts in Washington was noticed by an independent observer in the New York Times of September the 12th, 1989. Since then, I have submitted new memoranda to the CIA and American policymakers in which I explained Soviet grand strategy and its strategic designs against the West, the essence of the perestroika, the final phase of the strategy, the new use of the bloc's political and security potential for introducing new deceptive controlled democratic and so-called nationalist and non-communist structures in the communist countries, and the deployment of the political and security potential of the renewed so-called democratic regimes for the execution of the strategic design against the West. In the memoranda, I provided seven keys for understanding the perestroika, explained the danger of Western support for it, and proposed a reassessment of the situation and rethinking of that support as priority items of business. I suggested also how the West should respond to the challenge of perestroika and its destabilizing effect on the Western democracies. Since the Central Intelligence Agency did not react to my memoranda, I decided to publish them and ask the CIA to de declassify them for the purpose. The agency agreed. Several considerations forced me to take my decision. First, the democracies of the United States and Western Europe are facing a dangerous situation and are vulnerable because their governments, the Vatican, the elite, the media, the industrialists, the financiers, the trade unions, and most important, the general public are blind to the dangers of the strategy of the perestroika and have failed to perceive the deployment of the communist political potential of the renewed so-called democratic regimes against the West. The democracies could perish unless they are informed about the aggressive design of perestroika against them. Secondly, 
I could not imagine that American policymakers, and particularly the conservatives in both the Republican and Democratic parties, despite their long experience with communist treachery, could not be able to grasp the new maneuvers of the communist strategists and would rush to commit the West to helping perestroika, which is so contrary to their interests. It has been said to observe the jubilation of American and West European conservatives who have been cheering perestroika without realizing that it is intended to bring about their own political and physical demise. Liberal support for the perestroika is understandable, but conservative support came as a surprise to me. Thirdly, I was appalled that perestroika was embraced and supported by the United States without any serious debate on the subject. In the fourth place, I am appalled by the failure of American scholars to, paint out, to point out the relevance of Lenin's new economic policy to understanding the aggressive anti-Western design of perestroika or to provide appropriate warnings to policymakers and in their failure to distinguish between America's true friends and its Leninist foes precisely because these foes are wearing the new democratic uniform. Given the pressures they face, policymakers have no time to study the history of the period of Lenin's new economic policy or to remind themselves of Marxist-Leninist dialectics. But how could such learned and distinguished scholars as S. Biala and Zbigniew Brzezinski have failed to warn them about the success of the new economic policy, the mistakes made by the West in accepting it, and Gorbachev's repetition of Lenin's strategy and its dangers for the West? What happened to their credentials as great scholars? Why was it left to Professor Norman Stone of Oxford University to detect and make the parallel in his article in the London Daily Telegraph of November the 11th, 1989, and to express concern at the euphoria over Gorbachev? In his book, The Grand Failure, Brzezinski limited his description of Lenin's new economic policy to three brief phases. He described the new economic policy as amounting to a reliance on the market mechanism and private initiatives to stimulate economic recovery. In his words, it was probably, quote, the most open and intellectually innov innovative phase, end quote, in Soviet history. For Brzezinski, the NEP is a, quote, a shortened, shorthand term for a period of experimentation, flexibility, and moderation. I am appalled by Brzezinski's failure to explain the relevance of Lenin's new economic policy to perestroika. This failure is further illustrated by the following. A. S. Biala, a former defector from the Central Committee apparatus of the Polish Communist Party, wrote a foreword to Gorbachev's book, Perestroika, introducing it to the US public without inserting any warning about the parallel with the new economic policy and its dangers for the Western democracies. B. During his recent visit to Moscow, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former national security advisor in the Carter administration, met leading Soviet strategists, including Yakovlev, an expert on the manipulation of the Western media, and advised them on how to proceed with perestroika. Furthermore, Brzezinski delivered a lecture on the same subject to the Soviet diplomats at the High Dipl Diplomatic Academy. In fifth place, I am disappointed that Gordievsky, a recent KGB defector, did not help much to explain perestroika as the final phase of Soviet long-range strategy to describe its essence or to point out the deceptive nature of the changes and the strategic danger for the West. Gordievsky's articles in the Times of London of 27th to 28th February and March 1st, 1990 contained a rather optimistic, if not laudatory, description of the reforms, so-called reforms, initiated under Gorbachev and Yakovlev. I am puzzled that he should write so enthusiastically about them in the London Times. He might as well have published his comments in the party newspaper Prada or in Korotchik's Ogonek. 
His assessment of Perestroika and its meaning for the West is in complete contradiction to that set out in my memoranda to the Central Intelligence Agency. Further comment would be superfluous. I leave it to the reader to make his own judgment. In sixth place, misguided Western support for Perestroika at all levels, and especially among the Western media, is destabilizing Western societies, their defense, their political processes, and their alliances. It is immensely accelerating the successful execution of the Soviet strategic design against the West. In 1984, through that, in the event of Western resistance to Soviet strategy, the scenario of convergence between the two systems might take the next half century to unroll. Now, however, because the West has committed itself to the support of Perestroika and because of the impact of the misguided and euphoric support for it in the Western media, convergence might take less than a decade. The sword of Damocles is hanging over the Western democracies, yet they are oblivious to it. I believe in truth and the power of ideas to convey the truth. Therefore, I present my memoranda to the public, convinced that they will help them to see the Paris striker changes and their sequels in the communist world and beyond in a more realistic light, and to recover from their blindness. Anatoly Golitsyn, United States, 1995.